not a wedding, but uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll be married one day. <laughs> so, again, thank you so much for coming. This is a great turnout. It's a lot better than I imagined it would be. I really like the Crown Plaza. I'll tell you a little story. When I was 10 years old, my father sat me down and he said, Christina, I'm not going to be here for your birthday. And I said, where are you going? He said, I have to go overseas to Bogota, Colombia because the FDA told me that I can't build, bring the laser there. So he comes back and he builds his own laser. Long story short, my father was one of the early pioneers of LASIK eye surgery, Dr. George Rosakis. And when I came to New York, I asked him, which doctor should I work with? Who's the best surgeon in, in the city? And he said, without hesitation, Dr. Sam Levici. And ever since January, I have been working with him as his LASIK coordinator. And I have to say that I trust him so much that I'm finally getting the procedure. Because <laughs> my father was never allowed to operate on me legally. He was always afraid that he would, you know, think too hard about it. But he is an amazing, amazing surgeon. I've been filming a lot of the patients. We do a lot of um, in-house reality documentation. And he has over 25 years of experience. He truly is a LASIK specialist other doctors trust. He teaches other doctors how to perform LASIK, and he is a member of the Mount Sinai Hospital Medical Staff and School of Medicine faculty. And he has three convenient locations, Manhattan in Westchester, two in Westchester, in White Plains in the summers. And hopefully you will see what I know and understand after he presents today his brilliance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I will give you a little bit of background about myself, because you probably some of you I met, most of you I met back for the first time tonight. Can you hear me back here? Yes. Um, I was born in Romania, and uh, it's very depressing to say how many years ago I came here, but I was still in college at the time. Um, I finished my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering at the University of South Carolina. I call it the long USC of the Southern California, by South Carolina. And I had the double major with pre-med. Um, uh, I'm trying to find out what questions you guys have so I can tailor the talk to based on what people want to hear. Um, so then I went to um, I did the, then I went to medical school in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. I did an internship in internal medicine at uh, what was then the New York Infirmary, then became Beekman Downtown Hospital, and I did my residency in ophthalmology at Georgetown in Washington D.C. Uh, when I was at Georgetown, I was chief resident in uh, quite a few of the hospitals. I spent three months in Haiti doing surgery. And then I came to New York. Um, I took over a small practice on uh, Park Avenue and I was there for a while and then eventually I got married on 9-1 as opposed to 9-11. Uh, we were in Barcelona on 9-11. And uh, you know too we moved to Westchester and I opened a practice uh, first in White Plains then I moved to uh, Somers. So I have two laser centers, if you want to call them centers. I have a laser in Manhattan at 800 Second Avenue, and um, so the one from Park Avenue went to Second Avenue, and I have a laser up in Somers where I also have an intro race, and the second laser. And in Manhattan, very, very soon, we have Steve Schuster here, who represents Zimmer. We'll have a, hopefully an even better, hopefully, but certainly, Certainly, an even better femtosecond laser. Uh, we, it's time to stop talking about. Uh, I have nothing against Abbott, AMO, and so on, but it's time to stop talking about an intralase as the only femtosecond laser that we have. Um, so, tonight, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk essentially about femtosecond laser. And right now, it's uh, the femtosecond laser is approved for three uses: for ESACs, for 
for LASIK. That's how we start to get approved first. And it's already approved for cataract surgery. Cataract surgery is a much longer story. Um, I meant to make some slides about multifocal so-called premium IOLs, and I wanted to know from you if you have any questions about those. Uh, but essentially everything that I wanted to talk about tonight is something that they have in common, that either there is a very high reimbursement or people pay out of pocket for it. Um, so first I'm going to talk about the laser and explain the laser, the femtosecond laser. So going back to laser, I remember when I was a kid they were just coming up with lasers and we actually forget that really technically speaking if we want to be absolutely correct, laser is an acronym. It should always be capitalized. But it became such a common word that I don't think anybody remembers that anymore. And it stands for light amplification with stimulated electron radiation. And I'm sorry for my accent, the Romanian accent. So light amplification through stimulated electron radiation. That's what the laser on. Just like you have many kinds of engines, you have different kinds of lasers, you know, argon laser, yard laser. Uh, the Exima laser was invented up the up the street at IBM uh, to etch transistors, and then they figured out that you can etch cornea. And there's a famous slide over here that's been sculpted by the Exima laser. So the Exima laser is a type of laser. And then they came out, there were also the neodymium Yag laser, which creates a explosion, a micro-explosion of about 10 to minus second, I'm sorry, 10 to minus 6 seconds. But, uh, if you ever see somebody after the videos are operating with the neodymium yag laser for capsulotomies, notice it makes a little pop and patients feel it, or for your daughter. Then uh, I was involved with a picosecond laser, which was 10 to minus 12, much, much faster. And there was a company called ISL, Intelligent Surgical Lasers. They had uh, manufactured about 12 lasers that they sold all over the country. One of them was in Boston, Carville. Dr. Puliafito had one. And I went there and I looked at it and I said, no, no, this is not cutting it. The whole goal or hope for the picosecond laser was to create, to ablate, to destroy part of the central cornea so it will collapse and it can fit intracornearly, myopia, hyperopia, and what have So then we followed the picosecond laser, we got the femtosecond laser. And that's 10 to minus 15. It's very fast. Um, the XMA laser breaks the molecular bonds. The femtosecond essentially is like a yard laser, but an order, so many orders of magnitude faster. Because remember, I said the yard is 10 to minus 6, the femtosecond is 10 to minus 15. And uh, just to get an idea, in one second the light travels 7.5 times around the globe. In 100 femtoseconds, the light barely travels to a human. So we're talking about extremely, extremely, extremely fast pulses of energy which create a plasma, which this plasma then uh, expands and ultimately creates a gas bubble. So when you see what you see from the laser, it's not like an argon laser where you can put it on the wall and see the spot, you essentially see a little gas bubble. And then if you create more of those gas bubbles, it's that what you are going to see in the cornea or eventually in the lens when we use it on the lens. And please, this is informal, I'm glad you're here. Let's all be friends, happy, peace, and reserve take and ask questions. Don't 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 be if I don't make sense, please ask. Now, so what essentially doing, we're doing a bunch of micro explosions which create a disruption and they will break things. And then you have to decide how close apart you have to put them. With the intralase in general, the distance between the lines, because there are lines, um, it's about 10 microns. 
one of the advantages of the other femtosecond laser, the Zimmer, is they, their spots overlap. So the problem is, I'll show you videos later, is that when you have areas that have not been ablated, then you have to break them with a spatula to lift the flap, for instance, or to insert the impacts, or to remove the rest of the lens in the cataract surgery. Still haven't lost anybody yet? So essentially, long story short, you can think of the femtosecond laser as a plasma knife, or essentially a cutting tool. And that's why it's kind of frustrating when you, patients are being misled by bladeless LASIK, they don't realize that you still cut a flap. The flap is still being created. It's just that it's with a laser rather than with a keratone. The first ones were, uh, the first one that you conceived was in 1984. But in 1999, finally, the FDA approved the impacts for the treatment of myopia. Uh, at that time, the company was called TerraVision, and they, I think they came just a little bit too late because by then the extra lasers were out. I was doing RK in the early 90s, I was doing RK, and I wish I had impacts. Uh, and then um, the extra laser was approved around 95, I got one. And then the intax came as an alternative to myopia. But the extra laser worked so well that intax didn't really. They did much better in Europe because in Europe people don't spend so much money on an eczema laser. And so they still use them. I did a few patients treated the myopia, low myopia with impacts. Um, and back then we had uh, those corkscrew things to create the channels uh, rather than um, a femtosecond laser. I was talking with a care vision. I said, buy the intralase. They were just beginning to appear on the horizon. I said, buy the intralase because that's the best way to create a channel to put the impacts in. Years later they said, yeah, you're right, you should have bought it, but they didn't. And in 04, FDA approved the impacts. By then the company became addition technology, because you add, I guess. And in um, 04, the um, FDA approved the impacts for the treatment of capricorns. You see much keratoconus, we send them for transplants, we struggle with contact lenses. That segment's 150 degrees of arc, uh, the inner diameter is 6.8 millimeters, the outside is 8.1, and they, they have a nomogram where I think in Europe they move all the way to minus 6 if you want to treat myopia. In the States, uh, I think they only approved to minus four and a half or five, and they are about three or four. The height, that if you cut through one, is more like a trapezoid, and it's the height of it that creates, gives you adjust, this is what gives you more correction for the near side, so for my own. No questions? Uh, the principle being, if you look at the lower slide, that you, by pushing out the, the cornea, you flatten the center, and that's how it works for myopia. Uh, the um, intacts are placed at about 70% of the depth of the cornea. And initially, the company was like, well, we think we get better results with our original instruments, which creates or um, the channels rather than cut the channel, but I think they finally came around and they said intralase does just, well, intralase femtosecond laser does just fine and uh, use the femtosecond laser to create the channels. And that works very well. Then I also works very well for corneal ectasia for use catoconus forming uh, lacing in patients who should have not had lacing in the first place probably. Uh, I'm sure you see some of those too. The, the thing that's important in terms of keratoconus, we know that the cornea gets very thin and you have to have about 450 microns at the place where you, in the area where you plan to insert the impacts. Of course, if they have 
autoimmune diseases, the usual contraindications for LASIK and so on and so forth are also <coughs> officially the contraindications for index or catoconus, but in general, anybody that has a cornea that's not scarred in the center or over 50 diopters and too thin, less than 450 um, microns in the area where you're going to put the intacts in, is probably a good candidate. Um, this is a patient who had uh, a corneal, uh, would have been the pre, what do you call it, the pre-operative correction was plus 8 minus 2 following the intacts, you get minus 0 0.75. Otherwise, this patient would have had the cornea transplant. Um, you don't get all the complications and the major, major operation, if you will, that you would get with a cornea transplant. So if you can save them a cornea transplant, obviously, uh, it, you, do that, you do them a big service. I have a couple of patients with intacts, and they both need hard gas permeable lenses in addition to the intacts. Like, it did not do what I thought it was going to do. <clears throat> well, is it, is it really lower prescriptions that it works better, or is it? A little bit of both. I, for some reason, sometimes, even if the refraction officially doesn't change, they seem to do. I think sometimes if you wait too long, it's too late. And that's what one of the next slides is going to say. So one of the things to remember is don't, because up, if, you, if you don't think of intacts, the only option is contact lenses or surgery. What about corneal cross-linking? Well, that's coming, but that's not yet FDA approved. And we don't know what's going to happen in 10, 15, 20 years to that endothelium and so on. Um, it's not yet FDA approved, so that's not really a common there option. There are centers that are doing it. I mean, Peter Hirsch is doing it. And as, as part of the FDA studies. I thought he was doing it outside of the studies, because he's charging patients. I don't know. I can't answer. I'm not doing it. I don't feel like doing it yet. I, I think we, I want to see a lot more. I'm up there, but I'm also very conservative at the same time. Uh, but I'll tell you another thing, though, that with Intax, I think we're finding out more and more First of all, I think they should be done early, because if you wait too long, it's a little bit hard to do. Second of all, initially the company was really pushing uh, asymmetrical uh, segments, a, a bigger one at the bottom and a much thinner one at the top. I'm, the more I read, the more it seems like doing just one at the bottom makes more sense and they do better. In addition to that, and I meant to bring slides, but I apologize, I don't have them, CK, either inside or outside. Think about it, CK, you know what I'm talking about, conductive keratoplasty uh, for hyper... Okay, um, that's a radio frequency spots that hit the cornea, you put about eight of them and kind of like a prostring, it treats for hyperopia, makes the central cornea steeper, you see the spots. Used to be LTK, there was a laser that definitely didn't work, CK works pretty well. Anyway, putting a couple of CK spots inside the intact will also shrink the cornea and help. So I'm not saying that they work for everybody, that they panacea, and they, but they are definitely worth a shot prior to going for the cornea transplant. Is there and an age limit? Of, is there an age limit? Like a certain age, let's say if you see keratoconus in a 13, 14 year old, you know they're going to progress. So is, can you put it in them? Or? Are they progressive? If they're not progressive and they tolerate the contact lenses, then I would leave them alone. If they're progressive, yeah, they're progressive. significant, they get to be closer to 50, and uh, the case could get to be closer to 50, I'll consider putting them in. The beauty of them is that you can young them out any time you want. So if they didn't work, they didn't work. It's not like you hurt them that much. Except. And you can't even say they hurt them in the pocket because I'm jumping ahead, but insurance is now, I heard stories of as much, this is outrageous, $20,000 reimbursement. Uh, but I would say that five to $8,000 per eye is a reasonable, it's, if they prove it, the insurance will reimburse that amount of money. So for managing an $8,000 procedure, I would say it's, 
Yes. I'm a little unclear on two things. You said something about when it gets to 50. What do you mean by 50? It's 50 adapters. The, oh, the okay. I'm sorry. And also, you said better to do it sooner rather than later. Can you be more specific on that? Like, Yeah, if the cornea gets to be too steep, like it gets to be, you know, and scarred in the center, then you you have to go to cornea transplant. So that's okay. why, in a way, it's better not to... If, if you see that they're progressing and the caves are really getting out and they, they very, don't wait till the absolute, the last moment okay. where you don't have any other option except the cornea transplant. Do them a little bit earlier because they'll get better results and may, I'm not sure it's FDA approved for that, but may stabilize the cornea so they don't progress. Yeah, interesting. So the whole point being, and some of the next slides is don't, we all used to thinking avoid surgery, avoid surgery, avoid surgery, but in this particular case, it's probably better to do a little bit of surgery, meaning intacts, to stabilize them rather than to wait till they got so far, <coughs> the cornea is so thin and so steep that it's probably not gonna get much of an effect. And the idea is also not so much to correct them, but sometimes they are a lot more tolerant of their contact lenses afterwards, which otherwise wouldn't be. So it's not like it's panacea and it's going to solve them, it's going to make them plain on. But if they, if they can be fitted with contact lenses again, which they were not able to prior to this, then you kind of you win. Again, money-wise, I just said a lot more and more insurance companies do cover it and do reimburse for the price. The company itself charges about, I think it's seven or eight hundred dollars for the pair, and the uh, cost of the intralase, depending on where you have it done, you know, somewhere around five hundred thousand. Um, and I just made a big mistake, I said intralase. Femtosecond rate, excuse me. See, if you read the second paragraph, as the disease progresses, try not to wait too long before you attempt this or suggest it or offer it to the patients. Educate patients about intact earlier, before the cornea becomes too steep or scared. That, that goes exactly here. This is the suction ring, much like the suction ring, except it's much softer from a keratom. This is the suction ring from the intralase, and I'll show you later how you put it on the eye. And the intralase already started to create a channel. The intralase creates a complete ring, which is not so wonderful because sometimes the intracts will not stay exactly where you want them to be, they'll travel. Zimmer creates just the pockets that we need for the intacts. So, let me back it up again so you can see the whole thing. And you're going to start, that's how fast, that's real, real time. This is the channel being created, and this is the cut through which the impacts are going to be going in. And next thing you're going to see an instrument that's going to enlarge. Can you see, can you turn down the lights? Can you see? I think the lights. That in, it's, enlarges the pocket, we call it, for the intacts. There's one. Is it clear? Can you guys see it? And there, in go the intacts. With the intralase, it's really not necessary to suture the wound. There is an option of suturing the wound. I find that it's so little disruption of tissues with the intralase that I don't feel that the wound needs to be sutured. Um, with, when I was doing it with the regular mechanical way of taking down the cornea, then the suture was uh, needed. And that's real time, that, that's about how long it takes. They have a special forceps, you need special forceps to grab them, not any forceps will do. Um, Want to watch it again, or should I move on? Move on. <laughs> What's the youngest patient that you would uh, 
do this for. <coughs> Probably in the teens, if it's somebody really progressing and I wanted to try to stop it, I don't see any other option. But I've never seen it progressing to the point of requiring a transplant or becoming contact lens intolerant in the teens. So it would be like somebody that's really, really progressing very significantly, very fast, that I would do it in the teens. A uh, couple of more of clinical examples, minus 7, minus 6, pre-gas um, permeable intolerant, post-intax. Um, this is another example, minus 4, plus 5 becomes a minus 2, minus 6, minus 4, becomes minus 0.5, minus 3. I had a patient that was done to a few years prior in LA. She was like a minus 8 or minus 10, and she was fine for a while. She had very thin corneas. Uh, by the time she got to me, she was minus 225. She was 2020 the next day. Um, I don't even, I don't have the topography, so I'm not sure that there was really truly a tactic, but it did work like a charm. So, post lasik ectasia works just as fine. Um, just like regular complications for any surgery, like LASIK infection, infiltrate, some of them develop some little white infiltrates along the impacts most of the time if it's not infected it's uh, strictly bothers you when you look at them at the slit lamp it doesn't bother them and doesn't progress uh, glare i have a patient who had it done and while he's very happy he also tells me that the night he has a lot of glare i don't know why because it's perfectly centered doesn't have a large pupil but he's not sorry that he had it done um, any questions? So moving on to another use of the pen per second laser. Remember, it's really a cutting tool. Uh, the advantage of um, creating a flap with the pen per second laser is that when you have a somewhat thinner cornea and you really want to do LASIK instead of uh, PRK, you can cut the thinner flap. Uh, Again, unlike a regular keratome, the side cuts are almost vertical. You can adjust them. Actually, one of the newer interlaces has reverse cuts, so then the flap really has even less of a chance of slippage. And uh, the le less manipulation, less instruments, less uh, likely to develop uh, DLK or Sands of Sahara uh, inflammation under the uh, flap. I did find out, though, that unlike regular LASIK, I have to keep them on steroids significantly longer than when I did the conventional LASIK. And there were more problems, I remember initially when the intralays came out with uh, developing glare and halos and things like that at night, light sensitivity even weeks to months after the procedure. I haven't seen that anymore. I think they adjusted the energy on the laser, but I definitely have to see keep them on uh, steroids. And what I mean by that is probably LASIK used to be about five days or four times a day and five days or twice a day and that was it. With this one I keep them on four times a day for about two to three weeks and then taper them off. From uh, LASIK, the last uh, application, it's a cataract surgery. Um, there are three companies in the running, and I actually understand there might even be a fourth one. Fourth one, the only one that has been approved by the FDA at this point is the one that Alcon bought. It's the Lens X, um, and the laser is approved for anterior for the incision, the anterior capsulotomy, the um, uh, corneal incision, and then the softening or the cutting down of the lens. I think that there's going to be great, from talking with the salesman and all that, I understand there are a lot of doctors, a lot of centers who want to get into the cataract surgery with a laser. I don't think it's going to make a whole lot of difference at this point in terms of 
it's going to be a little bit safer. Probably the safest part of the body is going to be the capsulotomy. Uh, it will soften the lens. If it's a soft lens already, it's probably going to make it easier to remove. You still kind of have to use a little bit of FACO to remove the rest of the lens. It's still not ready, quite, quite ready for the prime time. However, my, my strong uh, belief is that once we get a good accommodating IOL or a premium IOL or a high technology IOL, that's when it's going to take off. Because you're going to have everybody that's in their late 40s and 50s who's going to hate reading glasses and be willing to pay 10,000, 12,000, whatever it's going to take to get rid of their reading glasses. And in Europe, they're beginning to have them, and I think here they're going to be, probably by next spring, they're going to, we're going to have some here as well. Uh, back in 05, I was using a lens, which was a regular standard lens. It was made by a company called Star. Uh, the material, I think, is, in my opinion, is the best one around. It's not acrylic, it's not silicon, it's called Colomer. It's a polymer combined with collagen. And, uh, had practically no inflammation after using the lens. And I did a study which I presented at ASCRS. And my results in terms of accommodation or ability to read two and a half years after the surgery uh, were better, actually a little bit better than the crystal lens, which was approved at that time. Uh, I use the crystal lens a lot. Um, let me might as well talk about cataract surgery right now. Um, I used the crystal lens a lot when it came because I figured, well, they won't read, but I won't hurt them. But nowadays, um, I've been getting away from it, and I don't have any financial interest from any of the companies. Um, I feel that the Technis lens, it's a better lens. As a matter of fact, I had a patient today in the office who I did it about a year ago, and he's now less than 2,400 the other eye in terms of a cataract. So he's been functioning for the last, whatever, six months, a year, with an eye that has a multifocal IOL, and it's said that, you know, you're wanting one eye, you get glare, you get loss of contrast sensitivity, yada, yada. It's 2020, he's reading, he occasionally uses reading glasses, and that's with one multifocal IOL only, and not a good eye on the other side. Um, there are I'm not saying that everybody's going to be always happy. And does anybody present their patient, discusses their patients about reading my wells, or you just send them to the surgeon and let the surgeon bring it up? Because the co management involved it includes the most state, most surgeons charge twenty five hundred dollars for in addition to whatever the insurance pays, so your co-management should be part of that extra fee. And if you're not doing it, you'll be reminding the table. <laughs> and seriously, the, uh, I, I would, I would, the only thing that I've listened to lectures, I use the word premium, other doctors use the word advanced technology IOL, so you have the option of an advanced technology IOL versus a government issued sanctioned IOL. Take your pick. And um, I, I don't try to explain that they're not going to need reading glasses. If I say anything, I said you are a lot less likely to need reading glasses. I'm not saying you're not going to need reading glasses. I'm not pushing it, no glasses. This is a perfectly honest statement, a lot less likely that you need reading glasses. And from my point of view, I think you should uh, not let the surgeon decide or do it for you. I think you should high on a bit of advice. Um, which lens, I think that would be up to that surgeon that you're referring the patient to. Um, any questions? Uh, are you um, postoperatively putting them on steroids along with premium lenses? You know, when I first switched, I was I was using this Calamer lens, the the Star, and 
they were, the reason I noticed I did the study in the first place because I was trying to give them reading glasses and they were like, I don't really need them. Or I would, they would take a plus one and one and a quarter. And so I used them for years and then I started to use crystal lens. And then all of a sudden I was getting a lot of information. Crystal lens is silicon, the other one is polymer. Um, I don't think with a multifocal is whatever the regular regimen is for an acrylic lens. That's, um, I, I'm biased. I like three-piece IOLs. A lot of surgeons like one-piece. I don't really understand why. I like the three-piece because it, I think it, you've got more flexibility. It settles itself better in the eye. And if you break the capsule, you can always put it in the salt. So of course, it would be a little bit different, but still. Um, that's my bias. It depends on what you know, what lens is being used. I don't think you need to use more steroids for multifocal than if you are the same material in that lens that's not multifocal. The other thing I'm going to talk about is, and I think it's time for your computer, because um, I promised I was talking about things that may make a little bit of extra money uh, outside of the regular insurance coverage and so on. And I worked with uh, Christina's father, and um, there was a doctor, there is a doctor, Sergei Zugan, who came from Russia, who developed a quote unquote reversal anti aging. All those big words I don't like, but essentially, using vitamins is good. Uh, but there are ways to keep somebody out of trouble and to help them a lot by using more than vitamins. Now you, unfortunately, cannot directly use them, but you can recommend the patients for it. And the so-called Zugan method, and I'm not happy with the name because like my name is a difficult name, but essentially it works on a lot of medical things, but we stick it to the eyes. When it comes to the eyes, in terms of macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, dry eyes, they could be very much help. And the protocol would be that if you have a patient that, let's say, has diabetic retinopathy, I'm not saying that you shouldn't send the patient to the retina specialist. By all means, please do. But in addition to that, you can offer them, say, look, this is something that we need to, this requires a whole lecture, the whole evening lecture on this. So I'm just going to give you a very, very brief uh, overview of, of it. And hopefully I'll pick your interest and we'll meet later or we'll talk another time about it more. But essentially, you have somebody with severe diabetic retinopathy, they're getting a lot of laser or macular degeneration, a lot of juice and a lot of dry uh, macular degeneration. You can offer them, say, look, there are methods, there are doctors who feel that by having the blood work and then have certain hormones and vitamins, uh, a lot more than the regular eye caps and whatever that you get from Arkan and whoever, Bosch and Long, having your hormone replacement and some other vitamins could help you a lot more than just taking the vitamins. Uh, again, for diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, and dry eyes, this works. So at that point, if you're signing up to, and interested in helping your patient that way, you can either send the patients to me, or you can contact the company directly, and they will interview them, they'll give them a questionnaire. If they sign up, you become a Zugan affiliate. Uh, I, I'm the physician. I'll have to order the tests, I'll have to order some of these medications as a doctor. Uh, they'll come in every three months and fill up a very basic questionnaire for which you'll be reimbursed. So there's no, like, not doing anything for your um, questionnaire about 75 that, you know, what's their vision, how are they doing, is their vision improving, and I'm if they have magnogen. If there is a report from the retina doctor, we'll get a report from them. And um, I, strongly recommend that you keep that in mind and think for for yourselves and for patients and for everybody else. It's the anti-aging medicine, it's really, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you know, there are even boards now for anti-aging medicine. And of course, there are different methods, just like there are, I don't know if you've seen that for something called Senegenics, 
Um, and don't be turned off by hormone replacement uh, because, like for instance, I know for women they were given estrogen, but they were given the wrong estrogen. And a lot of women got hurt by taking the artificial one rather than the natural one. Uh, in men, there are a lot of misconception about having additional testosterone. Uh, if your testosterone is low, you get a 40% greater chance of having cardiac disease than otherwise. So there is a lot, a lot out there, and the discovery is really snowballing as to how much it is to learn about this. After each cut to be performed has been programmed into the system, the Lens X laser foot pedal is depressed and the procedure begins. First, the capsulotomy is performed, creating a precisely centered capsular axis. This is very important as proper capsulotomy size has been shown to impact the effective lens position, a key parameter in IOL power calculations. Next, the lens is fragmented into easily dissected quadrants for efficient removal with reduced phaco power. Finally, the primary and secondary corneal incisions are created, as well as arcuate incisions. The laser can even perform multi-plane incisions to help promote wound sealing. Leading a new era of innovation in refractive cataract surgery, the Lens X laser is putting the future in motion. The first leap forward in laser refractive cataract surgery, Alcon's Lens X laser is putting the future in motion. Delivering the accuracy of a femtosecond laser to refractive cataract surgery, the Lens X laser is designed to predictably perform many of the most challenging aspects of traditional cataract surgery with highly reproducible computer precision. Capsulotomy, lens fragmentation and all corneal incisions are created with image-guided surgeon control. The first femtosecond laser cleared for applications in cataract surgery. Alcon's Lens X laser is an image-guided surgical breakthrough. Providing cataract patients with a blade-free, technologically advanced alternative, the Lens X laser is leading a new era of refractive cataract surgery innovation. The Lens X laser brings a new level of customization to cataract surgery, allowing each procedure to be specifically tailored to patient anatomy and surgeon preference. The video microscope allows the surgeon to use the patient's eye as a visual reference when programming the laser settings. Featuring an intuitive graphic user interface, a wide range of laser settings can be easily adjusted before and during surgery. These include size, shape and location of each incision, lens fragmentation and the depth of cuts. The Lens X laser is designed to provide patients with an optimized refractive cataract surgery experience. Featuring real-time imaging and integrated OCT, the Lens X laser allows for visualization of the entire anterior segment during docking, planning and procedure. The patient relaxes as the surgeon utilizes the high-resolution video microscope and live OCT image to gently guide and dock the disposable patient interface to the corneal surface. The large range OCT rapidly scans the entire anterior segment. This allows each step of the procedure to be easily planned, customized and executed. Scans of anterior and posterior capsules are efficiently captured, then presented as unrolled real-time images for precise programming.
it's Dr. Richard Fox. I'm here to tell you about the Zemer Leonardo da Vinci or LDV femtosecond laser. This is the newest femtosecond laser incorporating the developments in the femtosecond laser technology over the past decade. Unlike the interlace, it functions by an oscillating technique. Oscillating allows for millions of spots to be placed at extremely low energy. This allows for every small area to be covered by several packets of femtosecond energy, therefore giving us a perfectly smooth and forcep manipulated flap. This is actually the handpiece which fits under your um, microscope of your eczema and it takes about 40 seconds currently with our current energy to pass speed uh, paradigm. It's microprocessor controlled in terms of energy in terms of uh, suction. The flaps are consistently 10 millimeters or larger as required. The rim is not trenched, therefore it does not collect debris or heme, which can lead to uh, inflammation and diffuse molecular arthritis. The ablation surface is truly the key to any flap, and the major advantage of femtosecond lasers, and particularly this femtosecond laser, is that glassy smooth surface, plus the fact that no water has gotten up onto the treatment surface from, manipulate, from manipulation normally required of the interlace. The concluding comments here, simply, this appears to be the best combination currently available of the microkeratome and femtosecond laser. It's mobile, it's stable, it's working by oscillating, which means very fast and very low energy, therefore extremely low impact on the eye. With quiet eyes, without ablated rims or cap to capture heme or debris. Our 2010 and 2015 numbers are in the 70th percentile. This is from the reproducibility of treating onto a dry bed surface on a consistent fashion. The future of femtosecond lasering has just changed.